Amen. Now I'm going to read from Psalm, Psalm, pardon me, Jeremiah 23. I'm actually using the little Bible out of the pews, the, the little fat one. There's tall, skinny ones. The little fat one, it uh, is on page 800 and, um, 30, 816, titled The Lying Prophets. Jeremiah 23, verses 9 through 14. Jeremiah says, Just their pages going, so I'm going to wait a second here. Jeremiah 23, 9, page 816 in the little, the thicker Bibles. Verse 9. Concerning the prophets, my heart is broken within me and my bones tremble. I'm like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine, because of the Lord and his holy words. The land is full of adulterers. Because of the curse, the land lies parched, and the pastures in the desert are withered. The prophets follow an evil course and use their power unjustly. Both prophet and priest are godless. Even in my temple I find their wickedness, declares the Lord. Therefore their path will become slippery. They will be banished to darkness, and there they will fall. I will bring disaster on them in the year that they are punished, declares the Lord. Among the prophets of Samaria, I saw this repulsive thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. And among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his wickedness. They are all like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. Once you kind of got the gist of this, the prophets and the priests, he's saying, the the prophets and the priests, he says they live a lie, that they are pretending to be one thing, but they actually proclaim and live out something else. So let's go to Mark chapter 12. Let me give you a chance to stand for just a second. Mark chapter 12. Why don't you stand with me? Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 17. That's page 1061 in that particular Bible. It's titled, Paying Taxes to Caesar. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, and just notice how nice these words are, Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Then they asked the question, Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And then that last line is just tremendous. And they were amazed at him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Let me start with a couple questions. In fact, I'm going to ask a few questions throughout this. First one, I'm going to kind of repeat what Rob did last week, if you remember. Are you lazy? Remember that? And I hope you spent the week thinking, now, am I lazy about my spiritual life? Came back to me a few different times. And I'm going to return to that question here in a second. My second question is directed at someone in particular, okay? Donna, what country are you a citizen of? The U.S., she says. Have you always been a citizen of the U.S.? Where were you a citizen of? Canada. Oh, that place, Canada. <laughs> so to whom do you, what country do you give allegiance to? The United, States of America. the United States of America. She said it right here. I'm just teasing a little bit, and I knew Donna. I know Donna's background. Over there, I caught someone that or, was from, Nor from Norway. For, was born in Norway, so she was Norwegian until she was 21. Then she became. 
We Christians live in two kingdoms. Now, this is very much emphasized in Lutheran theology, but it's, it's true. We live in two kingdoms. In the words of this gospel uh, reading, we live in the kingdom of Caesar, and we live in the kingdom of God. We live in this kingdom where it's run by governments and people and human beings and has all the laws on the human level. And we live in the kingdom of God that is governed by the gospel and the word of God. But we are part of two kingdoms. It's possible to be part of two things, but it's a challenge sometimes. I remember Donna was, before you were a citizen, you had, you had allegiances that way. Sometimes you had to go up there and do something and there was all this back and forth. It's hard to be part of two things. And for Christians, we are in the world. We are part of Caesar's kingdom. But our real kingdom is the kingdom of God. Some Christians have tried to go to a mountaintop to run away from the Caesar's kingdom, but it doesn't work that way. Now we're going to get back to these two kingdom thing in just a second. In this passage, there are two concepts that I'd like to look at. Each one deserves a sermon of its own, so I'm going to give two and we'll stay till 12. No, we won't either. Um, there's two concepts that I'd like to look at. The first concept, the, the second one will be about the allegiance to, to kingdoms. The first one is about hypocrisy. It's almost hidden in the beginning because once we get into that render to Caesar thing. But these uh, groups, these Pharisees and Herodians, um, named after Herod, were sent to catch Jesus in his words. They were sent with a specific purpose. And boy, they were good at what they did. Oh, teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And then they spring their trap, they think. Is it right to pay ta taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? And you get the trap. He says, yes, you should pay your taxes. And then the Jews probably aren't happy with him because the Romans were oppressing them. If he says, don't pay your taxes, well, he might have been arrested on the spot if there was any Romans nearby for insurrection, not paying your taxes. Everybody loves Donna, don't they? So it was a trap question. And he says, Jesus said, he, or it says in the Bible, he recognized their hypocrisy. Now let's talk about hypocrisy for a minute. Hypocrisy is not just saying one thing and doing a different thing. It's more than that. Because sometimes we say something, we, we're going to try to do something, and we don't really follow through on it for whatever reason. Hypocrisy is saying one thing without ever the intention of it being true. It's a pretense. These men came to ask a genuine question. Is there anything wrong with the question, should we pay taxes or not? It's a valid question at the time. But the question, they didn't want an answer for themselves. They wanted to trap Jesus. It was hypocrisy. They didn't want to know anything about that. They didn't really care what Jesus said, except that they could maybe use it to trap him. That's hypocrisy. Contrast that with the rich young ruler in the Bible. Remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus, says, I've done all these things. What else should I do? And Jesus said, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And it says the rich young ruler went away sad. He asked a genuine question. The answer he didn't like so well, but he was asking a genuine question. He really wanted to know. He just wasn't sure, and we don't know, if he could follow through on it afterwards. That's not hypocrisy. It could be laziness. It could be, it could be one of the other seven deadly sins, but it's not hypocrisy. Let's illustrate it with us. Now, I know Holmes people, everybody here prays one hour a day, you pray when you get up, you pray at every meal, you pray when you go to bed, right? Yep, that's it, right? So I, I don't know if this applies to you at all, but let's say I say you should pray. And I would say that. I'm sure over the years that I preached about prayer and said we should be in prayer about this, that, and the other thing. Then maybe I don't. Maybe I say you should pray, but I don't do a very good job of praying myself. Am I a hypocrite? In the technical sense, I don't think necessarily I might just be lazy, not getting around to it. I might just be distracted. 
Yesterday, my, my other sister, not Marie, called me kind of in tears on the phone to tell me about what was going on with Marie and how it wasn't getting better, it was getting worse. And I was kind of glad I had a pretty good idea of what I had, was going to preach on because from that point on that day, I really had trouble focusing on anything that involved my brain. I could go down to the basement. I've been, we've been fixing up things since we had a leak down there. And I could put up pictures and do, do things. In fact, Betty's probably thinking, oh, man, there's way too many pictures up because I just kept putting them just because that's what I could do. Now, was I a hypocrite because I didn't work harder on the sermon? No, I was distracted. I was, there was something else going on. It, I'm not saying it was a good thing necessarily. I should be able to refocus and get into it. But it's not, it's not hypocr hypocrisy. But if I preach to you about prayer and then didn't do it, never had an intention to do it, that's hypocrisy. If I preach to you about you should be in church, but then I never went, never intended to go, that's hypocrisy. You get it? What hypocrisy is is not just the words and we don't do a good job of following through. It's words and the heart, that our heart was never there with it. Okay, so that's what hypocrisy is. So let me give you two concepts about two more questions by the way about hypocrisy first question what concerns you the most the hypocrisy that you see all around you in this world because there is plenty to find or the hypocrisy here because we have some jesus said one time why do you take that speck out of your brother's eye when there's a log in your own eye? And if it was applicable to anything, it is certainly applicable to this. Because if we are hypocritical in something, if we put on a pretense without ever really intending of doing it, put on a pretense of prayer or our spiritual life, whatever, without ever really intending to follow through on it, put on a pretense of, oh, we should really give to God, but um, we just give our spare change, um, but don't ever intend it. That's hypocrisy, and if, we do, if we're caught in that, then all around us we see hypocrisy. That's what happens when there's a log in your eye. All you see is wood. And with hypocrisy in particular, but with other things too, there's a tendency that when we know we've done something not quite right, we probably look for someone that did it worse and say, oh, well, they're worse. Look at, I'm not so bad, but look at them. Look at how hypocritical they are. Okay? So what concerns you, what hypocrisy concerns you most? Well, it really needs to be the one here or else we can't speak to the other. Can we? We can't. So we need to be honest with ourselves, let God speak to us and say, Mark, you really weren't intending to follow through on that, were you? Ah, uh, God, I guess you got me. And then God can work with us. Okay, that's the first question. Second question is similar to the first one. What hypocrisy are we are most concerned about? The hypocrisy in the world? Or the hypocrisy in the church. I think that's my phone, and I thought I turned it off. But sorry about that. It's going to click on me. Um, in 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 Facebook, you've heard me say this before. In Facebook, I have people on there that aren't very nice about Christians, about the Bible, and such. And I try to be a person that can respond to them in such a way to, to be positive about the thing, to, be, to say, well, that's not really, let's, let's talk more about that. Let's, it's not that way. But some of those things that people say on Facebook and elsewhere about the church, I look at it and I go, they're right. We were that way. Sometimes we are that way. Sometimes we haven't taken care of people. Sometimes we haven't been taking care of the needy. Sometimes we have been more concerned about our own thing than that. Sometimes we have been more concerned about money than other things. And it's important for us as a church to recognize that we are imperfect and we need to recognize our own shortcomings and especially our hypocrisies when the church says one thing and never intends to do it. It affects our witness, doesn't it? Our witness is not made poorer when we fail. It's made poorer when we fail or aren't what we say we are and try to hide it. When we fail and say, dear God, forgive me a sinner, and people realize we're staying on that level, that's a witness. Okay, that's hypocrisy. Second sermon. 
the government. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. As I said, that wasn't an invalid question. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? Remember those taxes to Caesar paid the Roman soldiers that were not very kind to the, to the run-of-the-mill Israelis to, Israelis, to the Jewish people. Should they pay taxes? Should we just withhold them? And Jesus is such a... Don't you wish that you were as smart as Jesus? I mean, it was a trap question. He says, yes, you're in trouble. Say, no, you're in trouble. And what he said, oh, show me a denarius. Show me a coin. Whose picture is that? It's Caesar's. And he says, well, then render unto Caesar what belongs to him. And then render unto God what belongs to God. And then that phrase that I think just sums the whole thing up. And they were amazed at him. So should we obey the government? Let me look here once. I gave my only 20 out at the other church. Hamilton is on the $10 bill. We don't have a Caesar, we don't have a, but we have dead presidents and others. What do we live for? These or other things? What do we do with this? Should we obey the government? Should we pay our taxes? The answer the Bible would tell us is generally yes, we should obey the government. Obey the leaders. The early church, the only time they did not obey the government was when they were told, don't you go out and talk about this Jesus anymore. And it says they couldn't help it. So the only time that we should disobey the government is when we really think the government is trespassing upon our, our Christian faith, our morality. Now, not just by doing stupid things with money. They, yeah, But we need to be really careful that if we think we need to disobey the government, we're doing over that. And that when we do, we're willing to take the consequences of it or else it's no witness at all. No, I got. I got to get rid of this. So there's no final answer in that. There's the answer of, we should be the best citizens there are, and only when our, it's a piece of conscience, an absolute piece of conscience, we go the other way. The second question I'd like to ha ask of, and I kind of started to answer it just already. When we talk about government, render unto Caesars. Think about what's the currency, what's the currency of the world? I probably showed you what a lot of it is. It's money. How many things are just controlled by money or wanting to be money or loving money or loving the power that comes from money? It's really that, that is kind of our cur the currency of the world. And this is a place where we live in the world, but we're not of the world. We took a collection because... For heaven's sakes, the world needs money. We have to pay for things. We have to pay for preachers to come and fill in. You know, we got to do all sorts of stuff like that. And so we are of the world. We, we work with that currency. But that's not our main currency, is it? Because what's the currency of the kingdom of God? Money? No. We use it, but that's not our currency. And there's a lot of ways to put it. I want to put it this way. The currency of God's kingdom is the love of God shown to us in the person of Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection on the cross. That's our currency. That's what we live by. That's what we continue on. Now I'm going to illustrate that this way. I'm going to skip you up here for a second. I'm going to take it back here. I can make sure I'm heard. I have in my hand Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Anyone? Sprechen Sie Deutsch? I have some Deutschmarks that are both, they say, 100,000 marks. Now, 100,000 in modern terms, Deutschmarks, would be $60,000. I'm going to send one this way. Just go ahead and pass it around. I'd like it back because it's part of a... I can't go any further. Betty's dad, my wife Betty's dad, was a bomber pilot in the World War. And he has English money, you know, and German money. And right after the war, that powerful Germany was one of the most powerful nations on the world. Suddenly was not anymore. It was defeated. And they could get barrels of these things, and they weren't worth anything. Not 60,000. Because 
brothers and sisters, I love you, but I wouldn't be sending $60,000 out there. Sorry, I just wouldn't be doing that. Over at the other church, Tom said, and you wouldn't get it back either. <laughs> you see, that's what happens with the currency of the world. It will eventually be nothing. It will eventually go away, no matter what. We might think we have, you know, I've been watching my retirement funds to see when I can retire, so on and so forth. It's all electronic money. I mean, it's, what would it take for it to be gone? I don't want it to be, but that's what it is. Everything in this world will eventually be worthless except the human soul and the gospel of Christ. And that's the reason, yes, we use the money. We use the Deutschmarks. We use Alexander Hamilton and the $10 bill. But we live for Christ. And we know that in the long run, that's, the, that's who saves us, that who walks along with us. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Let the world have what the world has. We participate in it. We enjoy some of it. But let us render unto God the love that he first gave us, the love that he wants us to share with others, even the unlovable. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the wisdom that your son so showed in amazing ways. And just as they were amazed at him, we are amazed at him. And we are grateful for his love and grace. Help us, Lord, to live in this world by your currency, the love of Jesus Christ. To use what the world has, but not to covet it, not to center on it. Help us to not, to help us to move away from our own hypocrisies, our own failings, and to be more and more like Christ, to admit when we fail, and to find forgiveness in you. Gracious God, thank you for these moments, for we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.